Let's begin with a word of prayer this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for all the blessings that you give to us. Father, this day on the last Sunday of this calendar year, may we reflect back on the many times that we noticed that you were indeed with us this prior year and, and understand that you are indeed going to be with us in the coming year. May we be challenged this morning as we look into your word to, uh, for those that don't know you to come to know you, for those that only have a bit of knowledge to grow in knowledge and for us all to be faithful in our daily walk, to have that as our focus for each day of the coming year. Father, we just ask this in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Hope you all had a wonderful Christmas. Maybe you got something new for Christmas. You know, new socks, new underwear, whatever. New shirt, new gun, new tools. New appliances, maybe. I don't know. There's always something about just getting new stuff, isn't there? It's just, you know, it makes you feel good. Even though the old sweater kept you warm, the new sweater, you just, you feel better wearing the new sweater. Uh, as a kid, there was just something for me about getting new shoes. I don't know what it was. New shoes made me just feel completely different, like a completely different human being. I, I swear to you, I could run faster. <laughs> Jump higher? Were you one of these as a kid? I mean, new shoes just changed everything. Even made you smarter, it seemed like. <laughs> or maybe that was just me. I don't know. But uh, even though Christmas is over, there is still something new right around the corner. That's right. The new year coming up, starting tomorrow. A chance for a fresh start. As the old cliche goes, it's like a blank canvas right before us, awaiting us. What will this new year bring for us? What's going to be different about this coming year? What, what things can we put up behind us from the old year? That's important too, isn't it? It's not just the things that await us, but there are some things in this old year we're probably, we're ready to leave it behind in the old year as we go into the new year. What, what new hobbies might you take up in the new year? It's just, it's full of opportunity, a, a chance to Start fresh. As we flip that page on the calendar, there's some anticipation in some cases, maybe some trepidation, but we all look forward to this new year that awaits us. I thought it would be a good time to see what the Bible might have to say about that. What wisdom can the scriptures offer to us in this uh, specific time of newness for us? Or biblically speaking, uh, we might say uh, it's time for a new song, as we'll see from the scriptures here in a moment. A time of a new beginning, something to start fresh or start over. C.S. Lewis once said, you're never too old to set another goal or to dream a new dream. And maybe that's true for you in this coming year. Maybe it's time for a new goal to be set. Maybe it's time to dream a new dream. The title of today's message comes from Psalm chapter 149. You can be turning there if you have not done so yet. The Psalms are a collection of poems, songs, hymns. The people of God have been singing these and reciting these for hundreds of years, and these are meant to be sung. How many of you have a playlist of songs? Oh, there's quite a few hands out there. Some of you shaking your head, no, but that's okay. Um, I have several playlists of songs. It just depends on what mood I'm in, what genre of music I want to listen to, and we have these playlists. Well, the Psalms, this is the playlist of the saints of ancient times. This, this is their playlist of songs that they would sing, and um, we're going to look at one specific one today. It's Psalm 149. And we're going to think about the significance of this new year that's approaching us in light of this psalm. Psalm 149, I'm just going to read the first five verses. It says, Praise the Lord. Sing to the Lord a new song and his praise in the assembly of saints. Let Israel rejoice in their maker. Let the children of Zion be joyful in their king. Let them praise his name with the dance. Let them sing praises to him with the timbrel and harp. For the Lord takes pleasure in his people. He will 
Beautify the humble with salvation. Let the saints be joyful in glory. Let them sing aloud on their beds. This psalm talks about singing aloud in praise to the Lord. Specifically, it says it's about the nation of Israel here. Maybe you caught that. As their king, the Lord Jesus Christ returns to establish the kingdom on earth in the millennial reign, all of which is foretold in prophecy. Uh, a lot of it in the book of Revelation, which we will begin a study in starting next week. But there's application for us as well, as we are called as the children of God to sing aloud the praise of the Lord. We see that there in verse 1, which is where our title comes from. Praise the Lord, sing to the Lord a new song. To sing a new song uh, to the ancient reader here in the time and the culture that this was written would be to uh, commemorate some new event. Um, and for us, of course, we're talking about the new year that we are about to embark on. In other words, a new song marks uh, something worth remembering or something worth celebrating. It's worth noting that the psalms, like our modern day hymns that we sing and just sang together, are meant to be sung together. These psalms are meant to be sung in community, by the community. And the events sung about are to be rightly understood as impacting not just one person, but everyone together, as everyone sings the song together. Let's say you get a new job. Well, you, as the individual, have a new job, but it's not just you that's affected by this event of having a new job. It would be your entire family that would be impacted by that, and um, the people that you used to work with as well. You're leaving them, so they're impacted now by your fresh absence from your old workplace or the people where you are going to your new workplace. So you can see how one event in your own individual life actually impacts the community. It impacts people around you. You may have heard of the phenomenon called the butterfly effect. It's this notion that everything that happens in our life is interconnected. So that when something happens, it actually has a ripple effect that affects everyone else around you. That's the butterfly effect. In this notion, uh, a small occurrence can have a much larger impact on a more complex system of everyone that's around you. Have you ever thought about that before with the decisions that you make? That each decision that you make in your life has an effect on everyone else around you from <laughs> those that are very close family members to maybe distant family members to again maybe just co-workers maybe just acquaintances you could do something that can have a lingering impact a significant impact to those people that are around you did you know that this principle is true for our faith as well and the way that we live out our faith in our daily life small decisions of faith can have an eternal impact for the children of God. Uh, hold your place here and turn to Deuteronomy chapter 7. Deuteronomy chapter 7 speaks here about the mind of God and, and how God is looking toward the future. I asked a moment ago, do you... Think about that with decisions that you make. How the decisions that you make impact everyone around you, and not just for the present, but also for the future. In Deuteronomy chapter 7, starting with verse 7, it says, The Lord did not set his love on you, nor choose you, because you were more in number than any other people, for you were the least of all the peoples. This is God's choosing of the nation of Israel, but... Again, it's true for us as well. Why did God choose us? Why does God love us? Verse 8, But because the Lord loves you and because he would keep the oath which he swore to your fathers, the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of bondage, from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Therefore, know that the Lord your God, he is God, the faithful God who keeps covenant and mercy for a thousand generations with those who love him and keep his commandments. 
God is thinking about his people out to the <coughs> thousandth generation. For a thousand generations. Do we think about even the next generation? Do we think about even this generation? And the decisions that we make and the things that we do, the things that impact our family, do we think about it even two or three generations from now? What if one small decision of faith today from you could have an impact on your great, great, great grandchildren? Simply because of a legacy of faith that you started or a decision that you make on this day. Have you thought about it in those terms? What would you do? Would it make a difference in what you would decide to do today if you knew it would have that kind of impact? I ask because there are several different types of people who are here listening to this message today. There are, there are those among us who have never sung the song of faith. You've been watching from a distance, sizing things up, considering whether or not this is for you, considering whether or not to jump in, considering whether or not to make this decision of faith today. There are others here today who sung the song of faith once, but for whatever reason, they stop singing. They no longer sing the song of faith the way they used to. Maybe you've been hurt, maybe discouraged, distraction, distracted, dis disillusioned, and it's been a while since you even felt the urge to sing any kind of song of praise to the Lord. And then there are those among us who just can't stop singing. They are full of faith and they've seen the unfailing love of God in their life. And they're just ready to tell everybody around them all about it. Anybody who will listen. They're so excited about it. Maybe there are other types of groups here that are listening to the message, but those are the three groups I want us to focus on this morning. I'm going to use Psalm 149 as a filter to look at another passage of Scripture this morning. Turn to Matthew chapter 13. In Matthew chapter 13, for those of you who may be familiar with the Bible, there is the parable of the sower. And we're going to read this passage, the parable of the sower, and listen for the three groups of people that I just mentioned. First of all, the parable itself, Matthew chapter 13, verses 1 through 9. I'm just going to read through the verses. Again, listen for those three groups of people. Matthew 13, starting with verse 1. On the same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat by the sea, and great multitudes were gathered together to him, so that he got into a boat and sat, and the whole multitude stood on the shore. Then he spoke many things to them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seed fell by the wayside, and the birds came and devoured them. Some fell on stony places where they did not have much earth, and they immediately sprang up because they had no depth of earth, but when the sun was up, they were scorched, and because they had no root, they withered away. And some fell among thorns, and thorns sprang up and choked them. But others fell on good ground and yielded a crop, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. The seed that's being sown here is the gospel. And people have different reactions to the gospel when the gospel hits their ears or when this seed of the gospel is sown in the community around us. Is there one group here that you identify more with than the others? Let's start this morning by those who have never sung the song of faith. In the parable, we see that there's a group of people for whom the seed, which represents the gospel, has been scattered, but something comes and steals away that seed before it takes root. Look at verse 4 again, Matthew chapter 13 and verse 4. As he sowed, some seed fell by the wayside, and the birds came and devoured them. 
We don't have to guess what all of this means because the disciples came to Jesus after he told this parable and they asked him what it meant. And so he told us what it meant. Skip down to verse 18. Matthew chapter 13, starting with verse 18. Therefore, hear the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, then the wicked one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. This is he who received the seed by the wayside. In the natural world, a seed just needs a certain type of environment for it to take root and grow. The seed here that falls by the wayside is the seed that doesn't fall on the fertile ground, you see. It, it falls on the pathway. As you walk on the wayside on this pathway, that dirt on that pathway, it can become as hard as rock. And that's the idea here. The, this message, you see, of the gospel fell on a hard heart. That's the idea. If you're trying to sow seed and some of it blows over on that well-worn, hardened patch of dirt, it could be just like walking out here in the parking lot and throwing a, hand to, a handful of seeds out in the parking lot on the asphalt out there. What would happen to it? If you walked out there with a handful of seeds and threw out the seeds in the parking lot, what's going to happen to the seed? Just as the parable said, birds are most likely going to come and eat that seed. It's not going to have any benefit, you see. Many times we get discouraged because it seems like the majority of the people that we talk to today, it's like taking a handful of seeds and throwing it out in the parking lot. Like it's an effort in uh, futility for us. We're not getting anywhere. Even though these people have heard the message of the gospel many times, they didn't respond to it then, and they don't respond to it now. Their heart is like a well-trodden path that has become hardened against the gospel, and they their heart is just closed to it. They may have a million different reasons for why, a million excuses that they could give you for why they're not interested in hearing the gospel, but the bottom line is they're just not interested. But what do we do about that? How should we respond? I want to challenge you to never give up on those kind of hearers. Even if there are people in your life that you know that this describes them, they are people who have never sung the song of faith. They are people for, as far as we can tell, all intent and purposes have a hard heart to the gospel. Don't give up on them. Don't give up. Because what can happen with pavement, asphalt, concrete, is that over time, cracks start to appear. And there could be cracks out there in that parking lot and you take your handful of seed and you throw it out in the parking lot, but a seed might get into one of those cracks and start to take root and start to grow. For some, you heard the gospel in the past and you weren't interested in the past. But now, for you, maybe, there's a crack here or a crack there. The question today is, what type of environment have you been living in for you? Have you been living in an environment that will foster the growth of that seed in the crack or not? Is the environment you're in one where that, that seed can truly take root and grow? Does your environment need to change in order for this newfound interest in the gospel to develop? If this is you, be honest with yourself this morning and ask that question and allow the Lord to come into your life and help you make this change to an environment where it promotes the singing of praise to the Lord where it promotes worship and praise to the Lord. 
Today could be the day that you sing this new song of faith. It could be the perfect day for the Lord to put this new song on your lips. What do I mean by that? I want to be perfectly clear. That there is absolutely nothing we can do on our own that will gain salvation for us. It's just not possible. If, if a few hundred years, a couple of thousand years of Jewish history taught us anything, it's that you just can't keep God's commandments well enough to earn salvation. So how are we saved then if it's not by what we do? It's by what God has done for us. Jesus Christ stepped out of heaven and took on the form of human flesh. That's the Christmas story that we just uh, wrapped up celebrating last week. But he did so in order to come and die on the cross of Calvary for our sins. The perfect blood of God, the perfect sinless blood of God was shed on the cross of Calvary for us. All you need to do is accept that payment for our sins. And that's it. Jesus Christ paid the price for our sins, a price that we could never pay. And his resurrection is proof that God is satisfied with the price that he paid. God, out of his love, made this plan of salvation. Perhaps you've heard John chapter 3 and verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That's it, folks. It's that simple. Accept the gift that God has given through Jesus Christ. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 3 and 4, he says, I present to you the gospel which I also first received, how that the Lord Jesus Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures, and was buried and rose again the third day, according to the Scriptures. Again, the resurrection is an important part of that gospel message. Because it proves that God is satisfied with the payment that Jesus Christ made for our sins. I am begging you, if you are one who has never sung that song of faith before, if you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, do it today. In fact, do it now. Right where you sit. God knows your heart. God hears your thoughts. Accept this free gift now. Next category is there are some among us who have stopped singing the song of faith. For one reason or another, that might be you today. Did you get discouraged? Did you get distracted? Did you get disillusioned? Did you, as we just mentioned, maybe not have the right environment before? for the spiritual growth. Matthew chapter 13, let's look at verses 5, 6, and 7. The Lord said, Some of the seed fell on stony places where they did not have much earth, and they immediately sprang up. But because they had no depth of earth, when the sun was up, they were scorched. Because they had no root, they were withered. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up and choked them out. The environment, you see. Look at verses 20, 21, and 22. But he who received the seed on stony places, this is he who hears the word and is immediately, immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no root in himself, but endures only for a while. For when tribulation or persecution arises because of the word, immediately he stumbles. Now he who receives seed among the thorns is he who hears the word, and the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and he becomes unfruitful. Some receive the gospel with joy, but it only lasts a short time. Trouble comes their way, and they quickly fall away from the path of faith. Or perhaps it's just the routine daily grind of life that just wears you down and distracts you from the spiritual things. If this sounds like your story, then don't feel too badly about that. It's a common story. Maybe more common than you think. Many a believer starts out well, but then they experience difficulties that choke out the song of faith in their life. Uh, maybe even strayed back into the world's ways. 
just because we become believers doesn't mean that you know life from that point on is just a, a bed of roses. In fact, it might even get more difficult after you become a believer. We have enemies at war against us in our spiritual life. The world, the flesh, and the devil, that is the world system that's all around us, our sinful flesh that we dwell in, and Satan, who is very real and very actively opposed to our spiritual growth. Staying on the straight and narrow is not an easy task. I'll grant you that. But most believers who slide back into their old ways of life, they discover that it doesn't hold the same satisfaction that it used to. It doesn't hold the same satisfaction for them now that they thought it would. A few weeks ago, we talked about David, who in Psalm 51 poured out his heart before God after being confronted by his sin with Bathsheba, a sin that had a spiraling effect that led to one sin after another sin as the sins piled up. You can turn with me there if you like, Psalm chapter 51, or you can just listen. In Psalm 51, verses 3 and 4, David said, For I acknowledge my transgressions, and my sin is always before me. Against you, that is God who he's speaking to, against you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight, that you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. Here we just see a man in turmoil in this entire psalm of Psalm 51 as David pours out his sin before God. He wrestles with himself. He had strayed from the path of righteousness, from the path of faith, and had lost the joy of his salvation. And so it culminates with verse 12. Psalm 51, if you're there, in verse 12, David says, Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me by your generous spirit. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. Sin will almost certainly bring temporary pleasure. That's right, you heard me right. Sin will almost certainly bring temporary pleasure or momentary relief from a situation or even a, a little bit of temporary happiness. But we all know that in the end, it will steal your hope and it will crush your joy. And there will be no spiritual growth in your life. And therefore, there will be no spiritual power in your life. And therefore, you will have no evidence of any spiritual fruitfulness taking place in your life. The true path of joy and fulfillment for any child of God is to do things God's way. C.S. Lewis, in his book, The Weight of Glory, he said, it would seem that our Lord finds our desires not too strong, but too weak. You see, we say our desires are too strong. The desire of sinfulness is too strong, and I can't resist it. C.S. Lewis says, the Lord finds our desires not too strong, but too weak. We are half-hearted creatures, fooling around with drunk and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered to us. We're like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in the slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a wonderful holiday at sea. We are far too easily pleased. The enemy of our soul, you see, is far too good at his job for us to think that we are not going to experience temptation and that we are not going to experience times of disillusionment and discouragement and doubt. But the trick is that even when those times come, and even when we give in to them, even when we do stumble, the trick is to quickly get back on the path of righteousness. To quickly get back on the path of faithfulness. To keep growing 
even when it doesn't look to us like there is much happening. To keep singing even when our heart is broken, even when it hurts, even when it's frustrating. Today is a good day to lay aside the past. Maybe you're one of those who for whatever reason you stopped singing the song of faith. Put that behind you as we leave this old year. And start singing a new song as we enter the new year. Move forward in your faith. Remember, as C.S. Lewis said, you're never too old to set another goal or dream a new dream. As long as you and I have breath in our lungs, it's never too late to take up our proverbial crosses and follow the Lord and get back on the path of faith. And as we do so, join in step with the faithful church who's been singing and praising and weathering the storms of life for thousands of years now, which brings us to that third category that I mentioned, those who just can't stop singing the song of faith. Matthew chapter 13 and verse 8. The Lord said, But others of the seed fell on good ground and yielded a crop, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. And then verse 23, He who receives the seed on good ground is he who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and produces some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. For many of you listening today, this describes you. You just can't stop singing. Your heart is fertile ground. You have joy in your salvation. You're just filled with faith. Some of you, you, you've been that way from the beginning. Others of you, maybe you were in that previous category that you stopped singing for a while, but you're back praising the Lord again. Now, you've come back into the joy of your salvation, as David put it. For you, we praise God for you, and we need you. We need you to sing loudly. We, we need you to help us. Those of us who haven't sung the song of faith, we need to hear it from you. Those of us who, for whatever reason, have stopped singing the song of faith, help us get excited once again. Encourage us to get back on the path. As the parable of the sower says, there is a harvest of righteousness that can spring forth from your life. And the bearing of that fruit begins here as you encourage your fellow saints through whatever trials and difficulties it is that they may be experiencing in their own life. During the pandemic, there were some people who were contagious and they did not isolate themselves. They continued to mingle with other people in groups and spread COVID to other people. Usually it was unintentional, but uh, you could trace the path of illness back to this one person at this one particular event. And then there was a name given to those kinds of people or those kinds of events. Do you remember what that name was? A super spreader. Exactly right. Unfortunately, that's the negative example of... Uh, affecting the masses by something from the actions of one and being a super spreader negatively. But on the flip side of that, you this morning could be the start of a spiritual movement. You could be a super spreader of the joy of faith. A super spreader of singing a new song to the Lord. Of helping us all come together once more to praise the Lord. I don't know where you find yourself today. I don't know which category it is that you most identify with. Maybe you're one who have never, who's never sung the song of, sung the song of faith before. If that's you, I'm going to beg you one last time to receive the gospel message of salvation right now. Not just today. I mean right now. Please do so. Because I guarantee you that the minute we walk out those doors, distractions are going to cross your path. There's going to be disruptions. There is a very real enemy who wants to steal away the good seed of the gospel. 
from you receiving it before it can take root. Please don't wait. Even if it's just a crack in your hardened heart today, give it a chance. I'm begging you. Maybe you're one of those who once sung the song of faith loudly, but the thorns of life came in and choked it out. And it just seems like your life has just been one thing after another. And so now, here you are at this place in your life, joyless and unfruitful. If that's you, I promise you the Lord is eagerly awaiting your return. Don't delay. Come back now. As we stand on the precipice of a new year, maybe it's time for another goal. Maybe it's time for a new dream. Maybe it's time for a new song. Let's close with prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for who you are. We thank you for your great and awesome love for us. We thank you, Father, for your faithfulness to us in this past year. That even for those who were unwilling to hear the gospel message was still proclaimed for them to hear it. And maybe, Father, they are now ready and willing to hear. For those, Father, who have been through some very difficult times, may they be able to look back and see that you were there all along. That your promise is true, that you will never leave us nor forsake us. And as was prayed earlier, Father, we thank you even for those difficult times. Because we know that you are able to use those difficult times to bring about changes in our life, even to draw us closer to you. And so, Father, as the foundation of it all, we thank you for the gift of redemption, the gift of salvation. And again, Father, if there is any one person listening who's not accepted that gift, may they do so now, this moment. Father, we thank you for the anticipation of this coming year. May the past behind us and the future before us remind us of your unfailing love for us. May we look to you to light our path in this new year and lead our way as only you can. May each of us, Father, sing a new song in this new year, a new song of faith. It's in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We ask this prayer and give you all the praise. Amen. <laughs>